and just at the top some quick um, housekeeping stuff. Um, excuse us if there are any technical difficulties. We should be running smoothly. Everything's run get nice with our tests, but you know, we all know after a year of tech running Zoom meetings, stuff happens. Um, so we'll do our best to mitigate anything that comes up, but excuse us if anything, you know, buffers or is weird. Um, definitely let me know if something's weird on that I just don't seem to be catching um, in the chat box. Also in the chat box, we will, that's how we'll be taking questions. If you want to just type in your questions for me to ask Talon and I will. Um, and if there's a question that you would rather ask him, let me know um, that you have a question and I'll like tell you when you're able to ask. Um, just that way it's not too many people trying to all join in at different times. And we don't currently have a lecture scheduled for July. So we're taking a month off. We had um, some scheduling conflicts. And so we're just, there'll be a nice little break. Everybody's busy in the summer anyways. Um, we'll be back in August. Um, so look out for those postings. I don't, I don't think I have all the specifics for that one right off the top of my head. But as I do, I will similarly post on Facebook and through our um, new e-newsletter, which we're also sending out now regularly um and we'll let you guys know what's going on then and now not to take up any more time i will let talon give his presentation on living tools traditional hunting and archery hot dog everybody uh, good afternoon um so this is going to be about an hour-long presentation um but i really would like to uh, do a lot more questions than i would just straight talking so I'm going to give you some information that you want. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and um, some of the things that I've got with me and talk a little bit about traditional archery bows, a um, little bit of uh, resource management, which is kind of the inherent drive for a lot of um, these things. You know, Shawnee people being uh, mostly agricultural hunting, it takes a little bit of a backseat a lot of times. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the environment and kind of how things are, are looked at through traditional lens. Um, but I would really love for, for y'all to have some great questions that we can get into and um, spend, uh, spend some time on. So first of all, let me introduce myself, and I would prefer to do that in Sawan or Duwewe in the Shawnee language. I would say, um, So that was just my name. Um, told you all that I was doing Fair enough. And then I told you my mother and my father, my grandparents, um, but uh, you could add whatever you'd like into the in introductions like that, you know, plans and um, where you were born. So for guests uh, where I work at Colonial Williamsburg, I do like to spice that up a little bit um, and uh, get them to hear a little bit more Shawnee language in their in their day to day ongoings. But uh, yeah, so I've got some things with me, um, you know, yellow. Let's see what's that. Uh, these are bows and arrows that I've got with me. Um, right? So these are um, traditional bows and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about these and um, see what y'all be interested in knowing more about. So myself, I grew up with bows pretty much in my hands, right? So um, from the simplest of just shoestrings on branches um, to, you know, trying to ask folks anywhere I could to see you know, how do I make, how do I make this or how do I do this or um, can you show me how to do this or, you know, uh, anyone I could ask and find out more about some of these things. So that was really from the time that I can remember to, to now. This has been kind of my main focus. This is what I love to do. So I've hunted with bows pretty much my whole life. Um, so I, let's see, my first kill was a rabbit when I was about six years old in Anadarko, Oklahoma. And uh, alongside my uh, my uncle and my grandpa, and then from that point on, you know, deer, um, one elk, bear, um, turkey, geese, groundhogs, squirrels, you know, coyotes, you name you name it, snakes, fish. Actually, at uh, Tecumseh Park, um, when the creeks came up and the gar uh, were in the parks, one of the things that me and my sister would go and do is um, she would stand in the water downstream, and I would shoot gar from the bridge. And she would catch them, throw them up onto the onto the bank. So um, I've pretty much always had a bow in my hand. And this is when I when I go hunting. This is the first thing that I reach for. It's my most 
comfortable tool that I have in, in my arsenal. So that's just a little bit about me and, um, you know, uh, some of these uh, traditional things. But bows have been around for a lot longer than, than I have been. So um, archery here in the Eastern Woodlands is a very old, very old thing. So obviously, um, you know, as people become more and more agricultural and the large megafauna start to die, um, you know, these things become popular about well, anywhere between, you know, two to 5,000 years ago. Uh, they start to really, really take off. And um, when we think about the life of traditional people in the Eastern Woodlands, Shawnees, Wyandots, and other folks there in the Ohio Valley, uh, hunting remains a pretty large portion of the diet, you know, um, especially up to the point of the 1600s, um, you know, where people start to um, become more aware and conscious of resources um, with European arrival. And then, of course, the introduction of the fur trade. So one of the most important things that I've talked to guests about is the fact that bows never really disappear. So from the point of their inception, um, you know, their independent creation here in North America to the point that you know, native people are being removed from our lands in the east out to places like Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri. Um, up to the modern day, there's really not a point in which bows are not around in some form or fashion, you know. And so uh, having traditional bows is a great way to still hunt and provide without a uh, need for resources like money, right? So if you can't afford for guns or trade for powder and shot and things like that, you can still make um, bows and points. Uh, with the things that you have around you, uh, pretty pretty simply. So, I will say that one of the things that I find most interesting about a lot of our um, traditional stuff is sort of the the people who are making them, right? So, if we think about historically and a long time ago, uh, looking back, you know, in archaeology and going through um, museum collections and things like that, and looking at these beautiful caches of points in places like Cahokia or um, you know, in uh, the Hopewell and Adena sites, um, and then kind of fast forwarding up to the point that, you know, uh, European folks start to arrive and diseases start to decimate native communities. There's a pretty staunch decline in the quality of a lot of material uh, things. And one of the things that I note most specifically is points and um, bows and such like that, because, you know, uh, the disease takes a toll on, on the skilled people who are doing these things but it's also quickly being replaced by ready-made goods like guns and powder and, and shot and such like that. And so um, the fur trade is actually one of the, the biggest drivers for um, hunting and the misuse of resources in the Eastern woodlands as that business starts to pick up and become the sole economy of a lot of tribes east of the Mississippi River. So that's one of the, um, that's kind of the main conversation that I have with guests on a daily basis. If they want to know more about, um, you know, hunting and, and bows and things like that, this is a really great resource and a really great material object that most people are familiar with. They know what a bow and arrow is, right? Even if they've never seen a native person before, this is, a, this is the, the key to the door, right? So these things have proved uh, very valuable to me in my life, not just in my own personal hunting and use of these things, but also in um, guest relations as well. So... Um, are there any questions to go ahead and get started with uh, before I ramble on any further? Anything that anyone has put in so far? I have not seen anything yet. Um, and I did just no, um, put a note over on Facebook, so that way I'll try and keep an eye over there for us as well. Um, sure. So one thing, um, you know, uh, is in the Eastern Woodlands and with Shawnee folks, there are a couple of different styles of bows, the most common of which is gonna be this, right? This is a very simple, straight self bow. It's made of a single piece of wood and it's got one single curve to it. Um, these are the most common and popular styles of bows in basically anywhere, right? And so hard, dense woods like hickory, ash, elm, ironwood, dogwood, um, locust, um, you know, Osage Orange, there are lots of different woods um, that can be used to make these bows. Now, one of the things that I hear a lot is people ask like, well, you know, what kinds of woods do you use? Do you use things like willow or do you use, you know, do you steam bend it to get the curve? Um, 
And so I don't think people um, grasp that, you know, that you really want the bow to resist being bent. Um, and so as hard and as dense of wood as we can get, usually the better for self bows like this in this style. So they're usually bent through the handle. So this right here is the handle section, right? There is no grip. Um, and so when you put an arrow on the string, there's no knocking point, right? There's no knocking point and there's no grip. It is reliant on you to keep that consistent and to keep that in place um, as you're drawing and shooting the bow. And so I actually haven't shot a bow with a grip in probably eight years now. Um, it's just become natural for me to, to shoot like this and it feels clunky, it feels big and bulky um, to, try and, to try and shoot a more modern bow now. And so I really enjoy um, these old style of bows. Now we do see occasions where bows like this come about, right? This is a small little black locust recurve. And the thing that sets it apart from the other one is that here in the ends, the tips are flipped to the opposite direction into these um, recurves or reflexes. So if you do see this, usually um, it's gonna be on whitewood bows like hickory or elm, um, and they're gonna be still flat, right? The rectangular um, cross sections that don't taper a whole lot. But the reason why I think this is, is not necessarily um, power. People ask, you know, does it add more power? Sometimes, but the real reason is draw length. Most of these recurve bows that you see, if you do see any of them, are fairly short, usually shorter than um, most other self bows of the same wood species. And I think what these are is these are great blind bows. Um, this is the bow that I would reach for if I was going to be sitting and waiting for something to come my way, especially if I'm going to have any type of structure around me, uh, because it's a short, compact little bow of a similar draw weight. Uh, you know, that you can still get a decent draw length out of without, you know, messing up anything physically for the bow. So when we talk about hunting and going hunting, especially with things like bows, right? Um, there are a couple of methods that are really well suited to this. Number one is spot and stock. That's the most common, um, you know, way that you're going to find single people hunting is, is spot and stock. You know the rhythms of your animals, you know your local environment, you know exactly where those deer and bear and turkeys like to get their water, you know their trails, you know what times of day they're active, and you can kind of place yourself according to that schedule and get into a spot where you know likely that these things are gonna be at that time. So either make yourself known and make your presence kind of regular in that environment without scaring away those animals or masking your presence to the best of your ability. Um, you know, to help those animals continue on as if nothing has changed. Now, the other way that um, you're going to find in the Eastern Woodlands, a lot of people hunting, especially kids, is going to be with blowguns. This is my personal blowgun that I use to hunt with. Um, I don't know if I can get all of it in frame, but it's about seven, just over seven feet tall. It's a poplar. Um, and uh, it's just got a a solid hole that goes down the entire length of it. Um, in the eastern woodlands, uh, river cane is the main source of material for blowguns. Um, and so, you know, this river cane is great stuff if you are someone who likes to spend time outdoors. Um, so, to kind of relate this back to, uh, you know, arrows and going out and going hunting, grab a river cane arrow here out of my quiver. This is a river cane arrow um, made of the same species, right? So this arrow right here, as small and as thin and straight as this is, is the same stuff that makes this blowgun, right? Now, most children are gonna start with blowguns. Most boys are gonna start with blowguns and mostly as gardening tools, right? These are the pest protection of a lot of these um, farms, right? So these boys, as they're running around, playing and going out for the day, um, they're learning to hunt, they're learning the patterns of these animals, but they're also defending our main source of food, which is agriculture. So um, when their body develops a little bit more, when they have the ability to start drawing bows, then 
you know, they might get um, their first bow. This bow right here is going to be uh, the first bow of a young man who's just getting started and uh, just getting into the point that he wants to start learning. So this bow is only about 15, 20 pounds in draw weight. It's not a heavy bow at all. But as you progress up further and further and further, you're going to find um, heavier and heavier bows. Most traditional hunting bows don't exceed 60 pounds. Rarely ever will you find a traditional bow that is meant to go hunting exceed 60 pounds. Uh, my personal bow here, this is my newest bow for myself. It's a hickory bow. It's about 76, 78 inches tall. Um, and it pulls about 115 pounds at full draw at 31 inches. Um, it was a little lighter than I wanted it to be. Uh, I was shooting for about 130 pounds, but uh, 115 still is not bad. This is not a hunting bow. This is a reproduction of an old school uh, war bow from here on the coast. Um, but this bow is not a hunting bow. And I say that with the distinction that mindset creates the tools, right? So we think about the same, these bows, you know, um, as hunting tools, the same way that you would think about a shovel or, you know, a hoe uh, as a gardening tool. It has its own specific place and it doesn't, it doesn't branch out beyond that really. So, you know, even to the degree that um, when we have items that are meant to go to war or that go out to go spill blood, there are specific places that those things stay. There are specific people who interact with them and they're not supposed to bleed over into other things. So these hunting bows are not weapons, they're tools. Hence the, um, the kind of distinction of this title of this program is that we think about them as tools. We interact with them as, as tools. And so, you know, um, that's one of the things that it's very hard for a lot of guests that come and talk with us to understand is that, you know, um, there are a lot of things historically that are multi-use. And I, I think that that are multi-use because they're kind of ambiguous in their nature. But these things are so closely tied to the way that we live, the way that we think about ourselves and our nature and the way that we interact with other sovereign entities like our prey and other nations that they have a very set nature to them. And so, um, you know, uh, these bows are very important to us historically and modernly. Um, you know, people that I know that make and use bows spend a lot of time on them and they spend a lot of time looking into old bows and also improving on um, some of our designs and things like that. So I've only been seriously making bows now, um, you know, of I would have any real quality for probably almost 10 years, maybe even less than that. And I know people that have been doing it for, you know, their whole lifetime, 40, 50 years. Um, and so, you know, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not very long at all, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of years that we've been using these tools now, um, you know, we're really um, to a point that there's not much that can be done. There's not much that can be improved about this particular thing, but it's really cool to be able to pick one of these up, to go and look for a tree that you know is good for making a bow, to cut it down, to wait a year, two years, what have you, to make that into a bow and then to go hunt with it, you know, that is a really cool continuation of some very old skills and um, knowledge of the environment. So I think that's kind of one of the things that this bow represents to me is our connection and our understanding of the natural world because it interacts with so many different things. You have to know your plants, you have to know times of the year, you have to know um, tree species and how they function. You have to know the rhythms of animals and the things you want to hunt as prey. Um, you know, and you have to know your own capabilities, you know, you have to know yourself and, and how you're actually going to go and interact. So I think that's some of the coolest stuff um, about bows for me. Now on to arrows, talking about arrows. Um, people always want to know things like, what do you make your arrows from? Or uh, what type of feathers do you use? Or why does that one have a big sharp point and that one doesn't? So for me personally, I like two materials, river cane and wood shafts. Uh, and when I say wood shafts, that can be a broad variety of things. So river cane is pretty straightforward. It is just river cane, right? That has been heat straightened 
and sort it out by its weight and diameter to match with other shafts. Wood shafts, whether they be shoot shafts, split wood shafts, um, you know, or uh, what you consider like the big carved arrow shafts, like um, the blunt tips that have four shafts that go along with them, they can be made for all different types of purposes. They're usually a little bit heavier. So if you're gonna make a specific hunting arrow, if you want something that packs a punch, that weighs a decent amount, um, but is also sort of fit for single purpose, I would say a solid wood shaft like this viburnum arrow is a really great bet. So it's a viburnum shaft. It's got a navaculite point on the front. Um, navaculite is a stone from uh, Arkansas. It's a silicate stone, but it's fairly short. Um, but it's heavy. It's got a really tight spiraled three fletch on the back. Um, you know, and this arrow is set up for hunting at close range, particularly for turkey and geese and other large game birds. It's kind of what this point this is what I had in mind when I made um, these points. They're a lot larger than a lot of traditional arrow points are. Um, so when people think about points, oftentimes they say, you know, or they, they want to think that the large points, the big points are meant for big game. And oftentimes that's not the case because if we think about, um, and this is what gets a lot of folks to understand, if we think about, um, you know, pushing this through, if we were just to hold it in our hands and push it through, let's say we had another arrow and the point was only the size of like my pinky nail, which is about the size of one of my favorite points in my collection. If we were to take each of those and push them through the same material, this one with a smaller point takes a lot less force to get in where it needs to go. Whereas this one here, you have to push a lot harder to get at the same depth, right? So the skill of a traditional hunter is not how far can we shoot it, right? So people always say, how far can you kill a deer? But really it's how close, how close can I get to that deer before I have to take my shot? And number two is how well can I place this point? So I don't wanna see this thing stick out the other side, clean out the other side, because now this point is just hanging out there being useless. What I want is just enough energy to get this point to sit in the middle of the body cavity, right there next to the heart and the lungs, hopefully pierce those things. And then as that animal bolts with that arrow, this big lever that's sticking out this side is going to turn that up and down and around as it hits trees and branches and uh, limbs. And it's going to basically look like a chainsaw got inside there. So your points are very important, but they're also disposable and we have to treat them like they're disposable because they are tools. So for a lot of cane arrows, we make what are called four shafts. Um, and four shafts are a separate piece that attaches to the cane um, and it has the point attached to it. So if we think about, um, where's number three? Here's number three. So we think about um, a cane arrow like this one right here, right? If we take this four shaft and we seat it down inside there, right? This is the hunting arrow for larger game, turkeys and geese and, you know, maybe deer and things like that. But if we don't want this, we can take this four shaft out, take and put a blunt point in there or take a cross point or whatever you want to put on the front. And so when you go out hunting, when you go out into, um, you know, the wilderness, you have some specific intent in mind. Are you gonna go hunt for this thing? Or are you gonna go look for this thing? Um, you know, or if you don't have a specific intent in mind, right? If you're not sure what you're gonna encounter or you're not looking for something in particular, um, four shafted arrows are usually the way to go. So this is my quiver. It's a poplar bark quiver covered with deer skin um, and a silver band around the top. It holds about, 25, 30 arrows comfortably, but that's a lot to carry around. It's not a terrible burden and I've got used to it, but imagine three river cane arrows with say three, four shafts each, right? Um, one broadhead, one blunt point and one um, cross point, right? Well, now I've essentially got nine arrows with me. Um, and so I've cut down on my weight. I've cut down on the things that I, I'm carrying around. And if you look at old pictures and drawings and things like that of um, guys who are going out, who are encountered hunting or who are out there, you know, in the, in the woods, um, a lot of times what you're going to see is guys with a bow and arrows either in their hand or 
alongside them, but not in a quiver. And so if you're going out for the day or you're going out for just, you know, the weekend, it might be more beneficial for you to carry just a couple of things with you and keep your extra four shafts and your fire kit and medicines and whatever you need in your side bag, rather than carrying along a whole um, quiver with things stuffed down the bottom, plus your arrows. Um, and so that's kind of been um, the way that I think about those and interpret a lot of the, um, the old stuff is um, kind of suiting it to your purpose. So how do you make arrows? Depends on what you want to do with them. But I'd say that applies to most anything. Questions yet? Yeah, we've actually got a couple. Um, so from back when you were talking about the blowguns, Sam Sit asks, how long is that river cane blowgun? This river cane blowgun is only about, um, let's say five feet tall. It's not a long one. Um, my tallest river cane blowgun, which is at work right now, is about 12 feet. And it is a bear to keep straight. Um, I constantly have to re-straighten that blowgun. And it's actually got a curve in it. So um, it's, a, it's a kind of a smooth curve up uh, because when I, when I drop that blowgun out horizontally, the thing just bows down. So I just kind of put a reverse, <laughs> a little bit of a reverse bow in it so that when it does fall, it's straight. Um, and I've also got a weight, a weight on it because I like a heavy blowgun, which is why I love this solid wood um, blowgun is that it's, it's nice and heavy. Okay, kind of follow up from Sam also. Um, how do you bore out the center of the poplar sapling slash shoot for the blowgun? Um, does it have a pithy center? Yep, so that's exactly it. So when we think about solid wood blowguns, right, um, it's usually more than one piece of wood. So it's, it's split, so straight grain woods like elderberry or poplar, cedar, and et cetera, split and use that core as, as a channel, right? Carve a rough channel and get that thing as, as close as you can um, without going over and then glue that back together, right? Usually bind it up um, until it's secure. And then from there, you can uh, take an, I like to use a um, threaded rod for all of my blowguns when I make river cane or poplar or whatever. I like to use a threaded rod from the hardware store as a long rasp to smooth out the inside of the nodes and you know do that kind of stuff. So um, besides burning it out, you can also take and work that down um, from the inside by by taking a long river cane pole and you know wrapping up a bunch of leather and, and putting sand in there and you know polishing it down that way. Um, but I find that the threaded rod <laughs> works really well for me. Great. Um, Sean Logan asks, um, how old the boys, how old would the boys be when they start out playing with blowguns and bows? Pretty young. So, um, you know, some of the most, when you think about like education, right? Certain parts of education, whether they're boys or girls, is going to be um, in kind of society and politics, right? Learning how to function as citizens, but also what aptitudes are they displaying, right? Are, are they more geared to this thing or that thing? Um, what are they attracted to and who can teach them how to do that? So traditionally fathers don't have a lot to do with their children because they're not the same clans. Um, their mother's male relatives are going to be very important um, in teaching them how to hunt or how to operate within their clan and how to kind of function within um, their society. And so like, as soon as you can walk and talk, um, you're going to be walking to council and listening and um, sitting alongside your mother. But then when you leave that day, you've got things to kind of chew on and contemplate. You want to go out and play in the woods with your friends, um, you know, your uncle or your mother's male relatives um, might uh, teach you how to do that, starting about mm, four or five years old. So, yeah, as early as they can handle it, basically is the best way to put it. That makes sense even with like I grew up hunting and fishing and like we started a little bit later with us because my dad was my stepdad um, but my little brother started super young you know it's like how you know what are you interested in? what can you carry just yeah yep. um, and everything is fit to to the individual right so it's not like there is a standard of you have to do this at this time you 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 kind of tune to your own clock so 
Great. Right, so last one in this group, um, Andy H asks, um, would the cane blowgun arrows have similar arrowheads to the regular arrows or do they have to be lighter, smaller? How are they different from the regular arrowheads? Mm, so if I understand the question correctly, do the cane arrows have the same type of points, same weights of points as the solid wood arrows? Because I think. I think so. And then also if they like between the bow and arrow, the arrow bows, bow and arrow bows, bleh, sorry, and the blowgun arrows. Oh, got you, got you, got you. Yep. So um, so for to answer um, uh, what I think is the first part of the question first, um, you know, you can see here, these are two points um, that uh, yeah, focus on that. These are two points that are both navaculite. One is made for a cane arrow, the other one is made for um, a river cane arrow, and they are as identical as can, um, same style of point. Um, uh, but between blowguns and, and um, arrows, I don't know a separate shot on both will and only, you know, arrows, but they're very different. And I wish I had some with me. Let's see if I have some in this drawer. It doesn't look like it. So blowgun darts are anywhere between 12 and 20 inches long, um, made of either split cane or locust or another hard uh, wood, like hickory, uh, but it also depends on what you're hunting. So most people today for darts, uh, myself included, a good cheap supply of, of darts is actually bamboo skewers. Um, and, um, you know, our traditional darts for going out hunting things like turkey, which is the largest thing historically I know that blowguns are used for. Um, you know, turkey darts are long and heavy. So locust darts are great um, for those guys. And so they're meant to pack a punch. And they're fletched with um, thistle down. So the seed fluff from uh, purple thistle flowers you take and um, once they're dry, break, break them apart and take that seed fluff and spiral it, spiral wrap that around the entirety of the, the shaft um, to fletch that, that dart. So you have like four, you know, three or four inches of, um, of thistle fluff on the back end. You can take a hot coal and trim that up um, to, to be what you want it to be. But then that fills the space in the, in the bore of the blowgun. So it takes up that space. And so when you breathe into it, when you push that dart down there, um, that plug that's been formed is what's pushing that um, down. So it functions a little bit differently from, from arrows, but there's really not a broadhead on the front. Um, you know, there's not a, a separate point that's attached to um, darts uh, as far as that I've ever seen. Usually it's just carved into the wood, either a nice good taper cone point, uh, which is the most common, um, you know, or you could carve it into a little, a little broadhead if you wanted it to. But for the most part, I mean, a good sharp cone point will kill about anything. Um, so. Okay, um, I think for right now it's pretty good. And then, you know, if anybody has questions, just keep asking them over in the chat. Um, or if you want clarification for anything that he just answered, or if I didn't ask the question quite correctly, let me know, um, but we'll let him keep going. Yeah, Natalie, you said you were a, um, a, a hunter, right? And you yeah. grew up out in the woods. Um, what, uh, what do you think about, have you ever used the traditional, traditional bow or um, any of this before? I sadly have not. Um, I grew up in Alaska. I'm Alaska native um, and was taught to hunt with, I think I started off with a little 22 initially with open sights. Um, and a couple years in, because my dad grew up hunting with bows and I asked to be taught and he had an old bow that he was like, oh, I want to, you know, I want to get a new bow before I teach you. And that just never happened. Um, so... <laughs> it's just a timing thing and you know this and that and so it's not something that i very much could probably still learn it's just something that i didn't do growing up sure yeah i think anybody can can um, learn and start so that's um that kind of brings up some other common questions that people ask um you know is like uh um, along with like how old do people start learning how to use these things is um you know how many people do you know that still do this or 
you know, oh, what was the other one? Um, how do these bows compare to modern bows? Is, a, is another big thing that people want to know about. Like, how does how does your bow? You know, how accurate are they? How accurate is a bow like that? Um, or you know, how does it compare to like a compound bow? Well, that's like asking how you know um, a, a Honda Civic compares to a, a Bentley. You know, it's completely different things. They're both cars. It's just you know they're they're a little different. So um, with traditional bows. You know, and I don't like to say primitive bows. That's another thing that um, drives me up a wall is um, I really, I really don't like the primitive connotation. It just, it just makes me itch. Um, and so these bows today can compete with a lot of modern bows, separate of compound bows. Um, you know, they, as far as speeds and hunting performance and um, you know, longevity, I would say they're, they're equitable to most modern, um, bows. So on average, when you're looking at like, um, a traditional bow, 55 pounds, 60 pounds, and a hunting weight arrow, 160, 180 feet per second should be very achievable for a lot of these things. Um, you know, and that's a lot of energy that's being, being carried, um, you know, downrange. I saw a question there about bowstrings, I think, pop up. Um, so what do I make bowstrings out of? That's, that's actually a very common question too. So um, bowstrings, traditionally, I would break up into two categories. One is animal fiber strings, and the other one is plant fiber strings. So animal fiber strings are things like sinew, rawhide, or gut, um, you know, and uh, those are processed and cleaned into um, usable materials. So um, I have some sinew here. Um, this is sinew, right? This is a, some fairly short pieces of sinew that I use for um, arrow wrapping, um, you know, when I make arrows. But um, this material here can be twisted um, and turned into cordage um, to create a very, very strong um, uh, material to use for making, for making strings. Plant fibers, things like dogbane or Indian hemp, um, you know, or on kids' bows, you might be able to get away with some other uh, lighter uh, cordages, um, like stinging nettles or um, like yucca and things like that, right? They all make good, good strong cordages. There are a couple of um, reasons why I might prefer one over the other, but that's something that you're going to be carrying in your, in your bag. So when you go out hunting, you should always take more than a single string with you. Um, you should probably take more than, than just the type of string you have. You should carry at least one plant fiber and one animal fiber string. And the reason I say that is because they're suited to different environments. Animal fiber strings are incredibly durable and they're very um, wear resistant, right? So they're less likely to, to snap on you, um, but they weigh just a tad more, not any, real effect on performance but it's it's enough that you're gonna that you're gonna feel it and they're less moisture resistant they have a tendency to absorb if it's raining or if it's really humid outside uh, or if you're gonna be anywhere you know you're gonna come in contact with water like bow fishing right a plant fiber string may be a better choice for that situation because they don't slow down as much when they absorb water um, they're low very low stretch um, but they're less abrasion resistant. They wear out faster than animal fiber strings do. And so, um, you know, you're trading that sort of durability for performance. Um, but yeah. What else? Um, yeah, we're getting a nice slew of questions. Um, so Andy H asked about the tribes hunted deer primarily in the summer. Is that correct? Um, if so, why rather than the winter when the fur is fuller? That's a good question. Um, so I'm going to try and answer kind of times of the year. So as far as I know, as far as I was told, the in the summertime, uh, fish and game birds and things like that are, are more so on the menu. And then in the winter, red meats um, become more, more popular. Um, you know, bears are fatter. Um, you know, their skin is thicker because um, bears and, and their animals, 
like their skin changes throughout the year too. So a summer, a summer weight deer skin is different than a winter deer skin. And you're right, the hair is also much different as well. For a lot of things, you're not going to keep the hair on unless you're specifically making um, like a sleeping mat or, you know, something that you need that cushion. But for the most part, you, the quality of the skin is what you're looking for. Um, summer weight skins, um, in my personal experience, I don't know what it is, but I find that summer weight skins, um, not only do they have a weird color and texture to them, they also um, tend to be a little bit more prone to like drying out and like dry rotting faster. Um, I have an elk skin at work that was a summer, was a summer kill. And it, the edges of the hide, you can kind of pick apart with your fingers. You can almost tear, tear the hide now. Now that comes from it being sat up in a closet for three years. Um, but you know, still the, the point stands that summer weight skins are just not as, as good of quality as the winter ones. Um, but we do have times of year that things are, are preferred. So everything has its, its time and place. So our crops and our planting seasons after the robins come, you know, um, in the springtime, up to the point that we, you know, harvest and, and do that kind of stuff up to midwinter and then green corn and start all over again, right? Um, there, there are times that we go out and we do certain things. With the introduction of farm animals, um, like pigs and chickens and, you know, small livestock and stuff like that, um, you're going to start to see some of those things actually replace uh, in certain communities, a lot of um, those seasonal um, dishes, um, even to the point that they make their way into some of our uh, art and carvings and that kind of stuff. So pigs, especially for some reason. Everybody likes bacon. <laughs> Here's another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Andy H um, asked, did they use blowguns for turkey hunting because it's more stealthy? Because um, turkeys do have really good eyesight. Yes, they do. Um, so I've been busted by turkeys. I don't know how many times. There's a funny story um, that my sister or aunties could tell you. It was down in Anadarko um, at my auntie's house. And I was hunting turkeys because I saw them. I had my bow with me. So let's go. And so um, my auntie and my sister were on a walk down the road and they, <laughs> I didn't see them, but they apparently saw me. They said it looked like Jurassic Park where the grass is just flushing. There are these two like flushes in the grass coming, coming their way. And all of a sudden this group of turkeys runs out in front of them. And then I jump out from the grass and bolt across the road um, after these turkeys. Um, and they just, they laughed and they laughed and they laughed. Um, but um yeah blowguns are great for hunting turkeys because you don't have to move so if you're sitting with your blowgun um if you can find some place that has low hanging limbs it's really great because you can literally just rest your blowgun and use that like a shooting stick right just hold that thing there um and it's a lot more stable and you don't have to sit there and raise your blowgun up to get a shot you just already have it in position right and then from there, right, all you have to do is take that breath and fire that shot. And that's about it. It's the closest thing that you can have traditionally to a rifle, right? Um, so that's, that, is a great, that is a great point. They are super stealthy for hunting um, turkeys. Now, the other benefit is um, I have seen, and I, you know, shooting at squirrels or um, birds and other things like that, I've only taken a couple shots at turkeys with, with blowguns. Um, I've only killed one turkey with a blowgun and that's it, right? The rest of my turkey kills have been with bows. Um, I have seen animals where the dart goes by them and it's like they didn't even notice it. Um, you, know, you know, who knows what they thought it was, but um, you know, I have, I have gotten more than, more than a single chance um, Whereas with a bow, that is a lot harder to do. It's a lot harder to convince a turkey to stand there and let you take more than one shot um, with a bow or a shotgun um, than it is with a blowgun. So, yeah. Okay. Um, then Jason but, asks about the length of the blowgun. Does it, how does it affect the shooting range? So that's a good question. Um, so one of the things that I like to kind of say is that 
in in my mind the kind of rough equation is that your blowgun can put a dart about 10 times the length of your of your gun right so a five foot blowgun you know 50 feet is is going to be a pretty a pretty decent distance but i i would only trust it to kill within about half of that half to three quarters maybe so my blowgun is um seven feet uh, my longest blowgun is 12 feet but i would only ever take shots um you know that i know i can hit so regardless of how far it can shoot there's my maximum range um that i have to take into consideration to make a good a good kill right so um you know there's a a record of um cherokee cherokee dudes hunting alongside um white guys and it was written that they one of the cherokee guys killed a turkey at about 80 feet with a blowgun um you know and so but it's just like that record of that one dude shooting a goose and flying at 100 yards i'm sure he told that guy he did it all the time you know <laughs> so that's exactly what I would be saying, right? Yeah, I do that all the time. I shoot geese. I, I shoot geese, um, you know, half a mile away. But uh, yeah, whether or not you can do it consistently is also, you know, a problem. So about 10 times the length of your blowgun is what I like to tell people. Great. Um, where am I at? Uh, Sam Stitt asks about, um, can you talk about different fletching techniques? Sure. So let me grab my quiver here. Um, now I we have um, basically two that I'm going to show you right now. Um, two different fletching techniques, and um, these are both common in the eastern woodlands. Um, they're both, you know, prevalent basically anywhere you look, um, and that is the three fletch, like this one right here. So three fletch arrows, um, you know, so it's three fletchings, right? Um, that are put onto the shaft in kind of an equilateral triangle or two fletch arrows like these guys right here. So where the, um, the fletching is actually two independent feathers that are not glued to the shaft most commonly um, that form this, right? Now, one thing that people comment on when I show them arrows is, oh, it looks like they're they're twisted. Is that purposeful? Does that does that um, you know make it spin? And yeah, that's exactly what they're for. So if you look down, sort of the the barrel right of this arrow, if you look at kind of how this is set up, there we go. You can see that those fletchings are spun right. They're spiraled, and that is exactly to make the arrow spin. Now if I grab another one here and show you the same, you can see that even though the profile is a little different, that spin is still present, right? It just has a little bit different way of going about it. So all the fletchings are, are airfoils, essentially. They're just really special parachutes. So on an arrow from about here forward should be the heaviest point of your arrow, right? Everything in the front should be pulling it forward. So when you push, when that arrow is being pushed by the string, this is going to gather all that energy up and it's going to drag everything else behind it. If it didn't have any fletchings, um, the arrow would want to turn sideways, right? Just like dropping a piece of paper. P paper doesn't fall on its edge. It likes to fall on its flat side, right? Um, because that's how all the energy, all the pressure is equal. This forces it to travel this, uh, the direction that we want it to travel. Now, I personally think that the two fletch, I, th I think that this style of fletching right here is older than um, the three fletch. And the only reason I say that is um, I, this, in my experience, is really great um, at driving heavy points. Heavy points love these things for some reason, in, in my experience. Um, you know, they are they need something in front of them to drag them along. Whereas you can get away with a lot um, with a three fletched. So arrows like this, you can, oftentimes I don't put any points on my three fletched arrows. If I am gonna plan on using them in the future, I just 
sharpen them into a cone point at the front and they work fine because points stone points don't weigh that much you know or brass trade points they don't weigh that much you know maybe 10 20 30 grains at the most and then that's about that's about it so um you know you can get away with a lot with um these fletchings the other difference is um we think about how they're put on you know um these are um some that are some goose feathers that have been um dyed obviously and now they're they're ready to be used for fletching so if you see the profile of these guys the way that we put these on the shaft is that they're actually put on backwards first so if the shaft is down here these things are put on backwards and then folded down pulled tight to the shaft i like to wet the quill a little bit so that way it's stretched out as much as it can possibly be and then they're secured to the to the bottom so they actually don't have anything holding them in the middle of the shaft at all um, if i know that i'm going to be losing arrows if i know that i'm probably not going to get this arrow back um, that's what i'm that's what i'm going to go for uh, it takes less resources it takes for me less time to to make that style of arrow and they work just as well so i've gotten to the point where that's pretty much my primary primary style of fletching great um sorry i burn through arrows yeah <laughs> i burn through arrows like dozens at the time uh, brian bird asks about um he said in the 1700s were there details of shawnee bows and arrows that distinguished them from those of other eastern tribes so are there details of Shawnee bows that distinguish them from other Eastern Woodlands tribes? For the most part, no. Um, as far as I would say, not really. There are some cool examples, um, like one in particular that comes to mind of a Shawnee bow that has a, um, a, an interesting cross section. Because one of the things you don't see a lot of is bows with an actual handle section. There's a Shawnee bow that comes to mind that has some pretty intricate paintwork on it, um, and it has a handle section. Um, and so, you know, that one is pretty cool uh, in my mind. But for the most part, straight bend through the handle flat bows are going to be the norm for most everyone in the uh, in the 18th century. Um, you know, especially as guns become more and more common. Shawnee bows are actually, um, I would say Shawnees and like uh, a lot of the Northeastern and Wood, uh, Great Lakes folks, bows are actually um, a lot shorter than um, a lot of folks expect. Most of the bows don't exceed the height of your shoulder, um, you know, and again, I think that's just uh, a style thing, you know, so the, the types of hunting that we do and travel. So these bows are built to be portable, um, to be functionally, really well made but also efficient but still be compact enough that they're not a hassle to carry around it is a nightmare to try and travel with this bow because this bow is almost 80 inches tall um you know it's it's taller than i am even when it's strung um you know and it weighs probably close to three or four pounds versus you know one of these bows that is pretty easy to carry around and you'd mistake it for a walking stick if you weren't looking close enough. So there's not a lot to separate Shawnee bows from other tribes in, in our region, as far as I'm aware. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Andy asks, um, I think possibly our last question has got multiple parts. <laughs> um, can you talk about the traditional shaping methods of the bows and then mm -hmm. did they soak them and walk it down a tree? Um, how do you tap an arrowhead? Okay. So first part of the, um, of the question is traditional shaping methods. Um, you know, I'll break that into like, you know, how do you, how do you actually make the bow? Right. So, um, your most important tool, but you know besides um uh your knife for doing a lot of the shaping or a crook knife for doing a lot of the shaping is going to be an axe of some kind so or an ads right so to go and look for the trees that you need and um, the types of wood that we like 
So locust, hickory, um, which are two of the, the favorites, and then elm, um, you know, those are some of the woods that we really, really like. Um, axes are going to be supremely important for doing a lot of this. And actually, an axe like this one right here is a really, really great tool um, because it can do a lot of things. We're talking a little bit about multifunctional items. This is one of those this is one of those things. This is an excellent multi-tool because this blade is removable, right? So this is my ax. I've used it to fell a lot of trees. Um, and uh, this blade can be an ax blade. It can be an ads blade if you need it to. Um, it can also be a wedge and um, a knife, right? If you need uh, an edge, if you need a blade to carve and do stuff with, this can do a lot of things. So um i really love this for for making bows um you know and we've had tools like this for for thousands of years right so don't let people tell you that native folks didn't have metal tools before europeans arrived um it's simply that a lot of folks start abandoning metal tools in the making of a lot of these things for convenience through trade or those things are being lost because of disease and um you know the integrity of communities um so the most important thing is establishing the back of your bow. On white woods, that's supremely easy because all you do is remove the bark and then oil this thing up um, to prevent it from splitting. And then that's the back of your bow. On hardwoods like um, hickory or like a locust or osage or you know those types of things, you have to dig down through a layer of sapwood. Um, and adds is very important for doing that, um, you know, or an ax, um, but preferably I would say use an ads. Um, and then for the profiling and shaping and doing all the large removal, I pretty much do that with an ax. And then from that point on, um, a crook knife traditionally is really, I would say you could, from the point that you rough shape a bow, you could finish the rest of it with a crook knife. Um, you can carve the profile, you can scrape things, you can carve the knocks. Um, you know, you can do almost everything that you need to do to the rest of that bow with a crook knife. Um, so, and a crook knife is just a little L-shaped handle with a, a kind of a, a swept blade um, that's used as kind of a scraper and gouge, you know, and, and draw knife all, all kind of put together. So, and then there was a question about arrows attaching the points. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is... Do you, how do you tap an arrowhead? Tap an arrowhead? Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that as how do I make an arrowhead and then how do I attach it? So arrow, arrow points, stone points in particular are made from silicate stones like agates, flints, chertz, jaspers, chalcedonies, petrified wood, obsidian. Those are very glass-like, uh, in their consistency. And so they have a very consistent fracture pattern, right? The Hertzian cone. Um, and so by predicting the, basically the geometry of how these things are going to break and shatter, we can reasonably and very efficiently predict, um, how to, how to make a point. So you might start with a little piece of river cobble like this right here, which is, um, some that I picked up last time I was in Oklahoma. Um, or you might start from spalls of a larger piece. Um, but either way, the process is the same work from the edges in and drive flakes. Um, to thin it down and to get into a rough sort of um, profile. And then from there, either indirect pressure or, or indirect percussion or pressure um, to get it into a, a final shape and then sharpening it with very fine tools, um, you know, to get a nice sharp um, edge and point on there. And then hafting it. Um, I haft my points with um, hide glue and pitch, both. Um, people say either one or the other. I use both. And the reason I use both, where did that arrow I just had go? Um, the reason I use both is that hide glue is very strong and it makes a great bond. It's, it kind of soaks into the stone and into the wood and, and really holds it to tight, but it's not waterproof. Um, and so I will take and hide glue the point into the shaft and, and seed it really well and then waterproof the seam with pitch um, to make sure that that point is not going anywhere. So I find that if I do just pitch or just hide glue, um, they don't stay in, as 
output as well as I'd want them to be. Um, now, if I'm going to be making arrows that I know are, are going to be made and then like go and shoot them immediately, it's not going to matter. But yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Um, all your info is great. The questions, I think it was, you know, nice cross reference and, you know, I thought it was a lot of good information. Um, this will be available on our website, like all of our other videos, um, probably within about a week, sometimes a little longer, it just depends on how much time I have <laughs> to get this up. Um, and in, again, we don't have anybody in July for anybody who wasn't here when I said that at the top. So we have a month without a presentation. And then in August, I don't have the full details, but we're going to have Jeremy Turner talking about 18th century clothing. Um, and just follow our social media posts and mailings and the whatnot. And we'll let you know, kind of like we did for all of our other ones, <laughs> when the dates and times are. Um, so yeah, thank you. And I'll let everybody get back to their days. <laughs> all right. No, thank you, everybody. Selenol Kindle.